Good evening, church family. And to all of our guests, you're our honored guest tonight. We're so glad to have you. Now, now be honest for a second. Have you ever thought? Have you ever felt? Have you ever said, I want patience now? That's called an oxymoron. Because you're asking God to give you patience, but you're not willing to wait for it. Another word for patience is waiting. That's all through the Bible, Old and New Testament, to wait on the Lord. But nobody likes to wait today. Our patience is very thin. If there are three people in the line, they're supposed to open another cash register because we don't want to wait. Instant rice, minute rice. Because patience is not one of the virtues that we really hold up. But it is so vital in Christianity. When James was writing this wonderful letter concerning the troubles and trials we face as a Christian, he began the letter by talking about the trying of our faith worketh patience or perseverance. And he ended the book in our text tonight, in chapter 5 and verse 7, be patient. Now, in the first chapter, we're told that if we need this patience to see things the way God wants to see them, we're to ask God for them, 1 in verse 5. Ask for wisdom. And here is a very wise concept for us tonight. Look at James 5 and verse 7. Be patient, therefore, for what? For the coming of the Lord. If you've ever been stranded with your family in a car out in the middle of nowhere, if you've ever been in a house with your family and a hurricane is approaching or even involved in it, if you've ever been in a situation when someone is is really ill, you're trying to get help, and someone comes to you and says, I just called, and help is coming. How do you feel? Whew, right? Like a big load has been taken off your shoulders. Help is coming. What James 5 and 7 reminds us is, be patient. The Lord is coming. No matter what comes in your life, remember the Lord is coming. Now, I've got some good news for you and some bad news for you. You want the bad news first? Turn to Acts 14. Acts chapter 14. The Lord is coming, but what do we do in the meantime? Acts 14 is when Paul is retracing his steps, establishing elders in every congregation. But in verse 22, notice what he says here. He's confirming the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith. He's trying to build their faith. And that we must, M-U-S-T, must through what? Much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Now, the last part of that's great, enter into the kingdom of God. But it's through much tribulation. Turn to John 16, 33. John 16, 33. These things, Jesus is talking here, these things I've spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Bad news? We're going to have a lot of problems in this life. He's writing to Christians. He's talking to Christians. People are going to be his followers. But the good news is, in the end, he's coming. In James chapter 5, verse 7, verse 8, and verse 10, the word patience is one Greek word. In verse 11, it's a different Greek word. In fact, I'll tell you, in verse 11, it's the same word that's used in chapter 1 about patience. There are two different concepts he's talking about here. 
The first word for patience, he uses in 5, and 7, 8, and 10, is another translation, is long-suffering. It has to do with people. I told you before, it's like Andy Griffith with Barney. He has long suffering for Barney. Okay? That's one type of patience. The other one is verse 11 and also chapter 1, 2 through 4. It's endurance. It has to do with circumstances in your life. The first one, dealing with people, you could translate, put up with them. When it comes to situations, Stand fast. Don't, what you're really tempted to do, run away from it. Persevere. Endure to the end. That's what we've talked about tonight. That is kind of patience with people and with situations. So he gives us now three wonderful examples of patience. The first one is the farmer. Now, I married a farmer's girl farmer's daughter. And just from observation, I'm a city boy, I will tell you, if you don't have patience, don't even try to be a farmer. He is the epitome of patience. So what did my father-in-law do? He had a farm, raised three girls, they all married preachers. Preachers are not patient people. If you'll read your Bible, you'll see that Paul, if you read carefully, he really thought Christ was going to come in his lifetime. And when John wrote the Revelation in hopefulness, he said, Lord, come quickly, because he ends our Bible. But if you're going to be a farmer, you've got to have patience. Patience. The first thing about being a farmer is that when you plant, the crop doesn't come overnight. The only thing that grows overnight is weeds, but plants don't come overnight. And they know that. It says in our text, look at the husbandman, the farmer. He waits, and he waits for that precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he receives the early and the latter rain. He's watching the sky, weather. You've heard of expressions of people saying, we're going to have this event, weather permitting. I guarantee you farmers live by that. Weather permitting. They're praying that they'll get their early rains to soften the ground before they start plowing and have that seed in that ground for the early rains to help it get started. And then he wants the latter rains for the crop to finally mature and grow. But can you control the weather? No. And he can have storms come his way, hurricanes, tornadoes. He can have too much rain or a flood and it rots the crops. He can have too much sunshine and burns the crops. He could have an early frost and kill the crops. And if it wasn't, that wasn't bad enough. You've got disease, you've got insects, and you've got varmints. Now, we have a couple that's coming to our school on Thursday nights, a couple I taught, both of them, at Heritage Christian University. And when I saw Philip one day, I said, Philip, what's your plans when you graduate from school here? He says, I want to go to the Carolinas. I'm a missionary at, at heart. And I said, would you consider looking at the Whiteville congregation? They don't have a, never had a local minister. And he did, and he got support from the Hartsville congregation in Nashville, Hartsville Pike. And he's been there over 10 years now. But he and Patsy come down for our classes. Now, he is a preacher slash farmer, okay? And he was sharing with us two weeks ago about the fact that they just had this bed of kale ready for, for harvest. They were going to harvest it the very next day probably, I think he said. But that night, the rabbits got into it and ate it all. So this week, he confessed to us 
As he was driving down the road there in Evergreen, he saw a roadkill. Somebody had hit a rabbit. And he said, I had to tell you, I rejoiced. <laughs> Preachers don't have patience, okay? But you got that to contend with, okay? You got overnight, doesn't grow overnight. Weather permitting, and then timing is everything for a farmer. Early rain, latter rain, just enough, not too much. And then when the harvest comes, and farmers will tell you this, I don't care if it's storming outside, you've got to get those crops in. Now, with all of that, why would anybody want to be a farmer? It tells us. Look at verse chapter 5 and verse 7. It says that he waits for the precious fruit. Now, growing up, if you ask me, uh, Stephen, where does tomatoes come from? Where does potatoes come from? The store. But if you're a farmer, I want you to turn with me to 2 Timothy 2 and verse 6. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 6. The farmer that laboreth must be first partakers of the fruit. If you're a farmer and there is nothing better than a ripe tomato, just picked and put a little salt on that, and man, you've gone to heaven. That's fresh. It doesn't taste like a store bought tomato, it hasn't been frozen. It's, been, it's fresh. When we have patience, we can enjoy the first fruits. Let me give you an example. Turn to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. He's talking here about evangelism, bringing people to the Lord. What he says in Mark chapter 4 is precious. Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 28. Mark 4, 28. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of itself, first the blade, then the ear, and after that, the full corn in the ear. So it goes in stages. He doesn't come overnight. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth a sickle because the harvest is come. The farmer gets that crop out of the field, like I told you earlier. All right? Now, turn to Galatians 6 and verse 9. Galatians 6 and verse 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing. Talking about Christianity. For in due season we shall reap, if what? If we don't lose heart, if we faint not. Be patient unto the coming of the Lord. And then going back to James chapter 5, he makes this statement in verse 8. Be you also patient, talking to the Christians, you and me, Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. What does it mean to establish our hearts? When we are born again through baptism, we are babies in Christ. We're a new convert. We have new converts classes. We're trying to bring you up in the faith. And we're all in a growing process somewhere along the line of our spiritual maturity. But we want to be established. We want to be able to stand on our own spiritual two feet. In Romans 1 and verse 11, they didn't have Bibles in those days. So Paul says, I'm going to come to you at Rome that you may be established. Give them spiritual gifts. But in 1 Thessalonians, turn there if you would. He writes this church here in the Thessalonian church. And he makes this, I think, wonderful statement. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother, and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. They were getting a little bit, you know, waiting for Christ's second coming. Some had taught them that Christ had already come. They were just really worried about maybe missing the res resurrection and, the, I mean, the second coming of Christ. And so they were very upset. And Paul was trying to educate them and establish them in the truth that Christ is coming that no man should be moved by these afflictions, 
For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Don't let afflictions make you impatient and give up. Then at verse 10, night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men even as we do toward you. To the end you may establish, establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. That's what James has been trying to tell us. The trying of our faith worketh Christian maturity, and we're getting more and more mature as we're waiting to finally be with the Christ for eternity. If you know one thing about a farmer, they always are working. If they're not in the field because of weather or between season, they're in the shed working on the equipment so they can use it when it's ready to go but they're constantly working. And in Luke 12, in verse 43, the Bible says, Blessed are those whom when the Lord finds coming, when he comes, they're doing. They're working. What are we saying? We'll work till Jesus comes. Just like a farmer. Being patient. I told you before, the word wait in the Bible doesn't mean sit pulling your thumbs. Think of a waiter that's waiting you at a restaurant. Nobody works harder at a restaurant than the waiter. He's constantly serving you. Same thing with a farmer. He's constantly serving the Lord. He's constantly getting the crops ready and bringing them in and starting them and finishing them constantly in that process. Even though it's just about farmers, now there may be exceptions to every rule, but most farmers don't fight each other. In fact, just the opposite. Farmers always are there for each other. You ever heard of a barn raising? Somebody's barn burns down, they all get together and build it back up for him. If somebody had some bad season, the other would share their surplus. That's just the way it is when you're a farmer. That's the way it should be with us. James 5 and verse 9, Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge stands at the door. If we don't do that, if we act like the world, we ourselves could miss the harvest. Look at Matthew 9 and verse 37. Matthew 9 and verse 37. Then saith he unto the disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore that Lord of harvest, he will send forth laborers unto the harvest. If you want to answer the Lord's prayer, he wants to put us into the field. Now, turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. John chapter 4, beginning at verse 34. Jesus said unto them, this is his disciples, who came back seeing him talking to a Samaritan woman. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look unto the fields, for they are white, already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto the eternal life, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth, another reapeth. I sent you to reap, whereunto you bestowed no labor. Other men labor, and you are now entered into their labor. We're all involved. You never know when you're meeting somebody on the street if somebody took that child, who's now an adult or a teenager, to church. You don't know if somebody planted, a grandmother planted the Bible seed in their heart. You don't know that. I never forget we had a, a preacher student in our, in our school and the reason why he was there was he was not religious. He married a young lady and they had a child. And one day they were thinking, so, you know, we need to go to church, take this child to church. Where should we go? 
And the wife clipped her fingers and went up to the attic and she found a box she had when she was a girl. Somebody had taken her to vacation Bible school. And she opened a little Bible up and it said the Church of Christ. That couple came, were converted, and now he's a gospel preacher. See, you don't know who sows. Somebody sowed. Somebody waters it. And God gives the increase. Amen? We're all trying to bring people to the Christ. He now leaves the farmer and goes to the prophet. Look what he says here in verse 10. Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. We talked about this morning about the children of Israel and how they were treated during the fall of Jerusalem. It was terrible. But what happened to them was no different than what they did to the prophets. Do you know Isaiah was sawed in half? Do you know Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet? They just would not listen to him. It broke his heart. They broke his health. He wrote the book of Lamentations, book of tears. John the Baptist was beheaded. Take the prophets as an example of patience and of suffering. I call it victorious persecution in Matthew 5, 10 through 12, or victorious suffering. Jesus says, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you. See, all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets that were before you. I call it faithful persecution. In Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9, though he were a son, Jesus, that he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made complete, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. And in chapter 11, we call it Faith Hall of Fame. You could also call it Patient Hall of Fame. Because it says about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, they all died not receiving the promise, but sought afar off and were persuaded that God had a better place for them. The Lord's coming. And then he talks about how these great people were victorious. And then he, he changes gears in verse 35 and says, and some of them, all these terrible sufferings and persecutions and woes, and the author gets so upset about it, he says, the world is not worthy of them, how they were treated. And then in chapter 12 and verse 1, seeing we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Faithful persecution. And then enduring persecution. I love this thought. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 14, Jesus, he has been preaching, he's been teaching, performing miracles. People are talking about him, but he's not sure they understand him. So he asked their apostles, you're out there in the crowd, you're hearing what people are saying, who do men say that I am? Listen to what they say. Some say you are... John the Baptist. He's already passed away now. Some say you are Elijah, a prophet. Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. What are they saying? First of all, they're saying this, that no matter how terrible the Isaiahs, the Jeremiahs, the John the Baptist were treated, they weren't forgotten. And second of all, they were so impressive that when Jesus was so impressive, they compared him to him, to them. I'm sure Jeremiah, he's taken into, we think he, 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 he left and went down into Egypt because he told him it was going to fall and Jerusalem fell. But he probably died thinking he was a failure. But 700 years later, Jesus reminded them of Jeremiah. That's powerful. The patience of prophets. And so, 
how would you, how would you like, you, you want to stand in Isaiah's shoes at Judgment Day? I would love to. Or John the Baptist? I would love to stand in their shoes on Judgment Day. But do you want to be in their shoes on earth? That's how they got there. It was through the patience and the perseverance. And then he changes gears again. By the way, verse 11 he says, Behold, we count them, talking about the prophets, happy, blessed, which endure. Yeah, they're blessed because we know they're going to heaven. Look what they faced on earth. Have you heard of the patience of Job? Have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercies. Literally, they are very compassionate. God's very compassionate and of tender mercies. You know the book of Job. There hasn't been a person in the Bible, maybe in all time, that suffered like that man suffered. But you know why he suffered? If you read the first chapter of the book of Job, you'd wish those words be said about you at your funeral. He was a wonderful, godly man in every way. And yet the world caved in on him. Now, be honest. Again, do we fall in the same trap today? You remember the apostles walking with Jesus one day and they saw a man blind? And they said, did his father sin or did he sin to cause this upon him? And Christ said, neither one to cause this. But too many times in life, we think things are going well with somebody, it's because they're doing well doing right. But when things are going wrong with them, what did they do wrong? Job didn't do anything wrong. Bad things happen to good people through no fault of their own. But how do they handle it is the question. Let's look at Job for a second. Go to the book of Job. And as you do, let me remind you of these sayings we have here on the screen. You can't persevere if you have no trials. Just let that sink in for a minute. You don't have any victories unless you have battles. But you never give up. Job chapter 1. He just heard that he lost all of his possessions, and then the one, the backbreaker, he lost all of his children at one time. In verse 20, then Job arose, tore his clothes, shaved his head, fell upon the ground and worshiped and said, naked I came into this, out of this womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Wow. In chapter 2, Satan says, yeah, because I didn't touch him. Let me touch him, and he'll curse you to your face. Go ahead and touch him, but you can't kill him, God says. And he made it a, a living death for him. And his own wife even said, why don't you just curse God? He, he might strike you dead and get out of your misery. No. Verse 10, he says, you speak. That's one of the foolish women speak. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. Wow. Then in chapter 13, and verse 15, listen to what he says here. He doesn't understand what's going on. We don't understand a lot of times what's going on in our lives. Though he slay me, if God just allows me to be killed, yet will I trust him. I will maintain my own ways before him. I know I don't deserve what this is going on in my life, but God has a reason. And if he kills me, I still will trust him. So in chapter 42, Job, James chapter 5 says, the end of the Lord. That the Lord is very pitiful or compassionate and tender mercies. First of all, Job realizes after God talks to him, when God says, where were you when I created the heavens and the earth? He says, you're right. You're God and I'm not. I shouldn't even question you. And then he says to the, the three friends, you were all wrong concerning what you said against him. You need to apologize to Job. But then, Job, I'm going to give you twice as much as you had in the beginning. 
The Lord is very compassionate and of tender mercies. Enduring patience. If there's nothing to endure, how do you learn endurance? An impatient Christian is a powerful tool for Satan. Saul, the king, couldn't wait for Samuel to get there to offer the sacrifice before they went to battle. So he offered the sacrifice. And then later on, he was told to go down, oh, destroy the Amalekites. And he brought back the king and some of the herds. And finally Samuel says, you've lost the kingdom. Moses, as great a man as he was, but he's still a man, lost it, struck that rock when he was supposed to speak to it, took the credit for the water. And God says you can't enter the promised land physically. You were too impatient. Now, in one word, if you want to explain impatience in the context of Abraham, Ishmael, he couldn't wait for Isaac. And the Ishmaelites were the arch enemy of the Israelites the rest of their existence. To throw in the flesh. Impatience. Peter. Now we know how impetuous Peter was. Do you realize if it wasn't for the grace of God he'd been a murderer? That night with that sword, he wasn't going for the man's ear. The man ducked and he got his, he was going for the head. And Christ says, put down that sword. Impatience. Paul. I told you Paul was looking for the Lord's second coming his whole life. But I love 2 Corinthians 12, where we saw this morning. And Paul prayed three times to take that thorn from him. But the response was, by grace is sufficient. Patience. So here are five things that James tells us not to do if you're going to be patient for the Lord. Don't start using bad words. Start swearing, taking wrong O's and things. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Number two, lean on the grace of God. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 6, Peter says, we have manifold trials, many flavored trials. And in 4.10, he says, we have many flavored, many colored graces, a grace for every trial. Thirdly, go to the throne. Pray to your God through your high priest, Jesus. He says he's not, he's been touched with the feelings of our infirmities and all points to like as we are yet without sin. So we can boldly come before the grace of God and, and pray and he forget. He understands. Stay in the word. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. And hold to your church family. Now we use this verse, we ought to, to show the importance of church attendance. But I want you to really look at this verse with you now and this idea we've been talking about tonight. See how it really comes to the, out for you now. Don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is. He's already said, some folks are already falling away. Don't forsake the assembly. Why? Encourage one another. One of the things that we do when we gather and worship God together is we're saying we are in it together. We're not the only ones out there. We are, like you, being patient through the tough times as well as the good times. And we're encouraging you to be patient. Look what it says. Encouraging one another and so much the more what? As you see the day approaching. What day? The coming of the Lord. Why do we come to church? To worship God. Why do we come to church? To encourage one another. Why do we come to church? Because we can't wait to be church forever in heaven. Patience until the coming of the Lord. I want patience now. I want patience. You want patience. But we want patience when God gives it to us. Tonight, maybe you've been patient in the wrong way, patient with your salvation. 
you haven't got around to it. And you know you need to obey the Lord. Well, you need not that patience. You need to come forward and be baptized in the Christ. To have your sins washed away. Become a New Testament Christian and live the Christian life. Maybe you haven't been living like you should. You need to come forward and we'll pray with you and for you that you might be patient in your life, patient with yourself, patient with God, patient with others. Will you come?